Hello and welcome to This Week in Legacy. I'm your host, Joe Dyer, and in this video I'm going to be talking about a deck that I have been playing for a while now called Winota Stompy. The idea behind this deck is that it is an aggressive prison shell, playing typical Stompy cards such as Chalice of the Void and Ancient Tomb, in addition to prison elements like Trinisphere, and also a few copies of Thalia, Guardian, and Othraven. However, the deck also has an aggressive slant to it, abusing the triggered ability of the card Winota Joiner of Forces from Ikoria Lair of Behemoths. Winota's triggered ability puts onto the battlefield a human creature from the top six cards of your library whenever a non-human creature attacks. That's right, she doesn't even need to attack to trigger herself. The only thing that needs to attack is a non-human creature. As an extra bonus, the human that is put onto the battlefield also gains indestructible until end of turn. Within the Legacy format, there are plenty of creatures that can synergize well with this plan, namely creatures such as Goblin Rabblemaster and Legion Warboss. These creatures create tokens that can attack, allowing you to abuse multiple triggers off of the Winota. In addition, Season Pyromancer creates non-human tokens while also filtering through your deck. This can be a very big thing for decks like this that don't typically draw a lot of cards, being able to pitch cards and generate bodies. The biggest payoff to Winota's triggers is the card Angress Marauders, which is a damage doubler for sources you control. Multiple Marauders put into play stack, which can quickly turn a few, just a few creatures attacking into an attack for lethal. In my experience with this deck so far, it has been found that many combat steps are also just uh, ended quickly by a couple Marauders put into play. As far as the sideboard of this deck is concerned, it also plays a few cards typical to red prison strategies in Legacy, such as Scab Clan Berserker for storm-based strategies, Magus of the Moon for non-basic heavy decks, and Fiery Confluence for artifact heavy decks, as well as pushing through damage to the opponent. I played this deck to a 3-2 finish in my first league with the deck, and was pleasantly surprised at how quickly the deck can end games. To that end, we're going to go over the matches in the league individually. Match 1 versus World Gorger Dragon Combo. This match did a great job of showing off how a deck can obscure what it is based on normal gameplay. As noted, the match was against the World Gorger Dragon Combo deck, which operates in a shell that is similar to the Snow Control decks. In fact, it's nearly indistinguishable from Snow Control until it actually goes off. In this first game, my opponent reveals Yorion, Sky Nomad, as their companion, further giving the impression that they're on snow. The hand I've opened on is not hateful, but it can put down a turn one Thalia Guardian of Thraven as pressure and disruption. I am on the draw in this game. And my opponent leads on a Ponder. Again, further giving an impression that they are on snow control. I can pitch the Blood Sun to the Chrome Mox here. Uh, because being a basic heavy astrolabe deck doesn't do much to this deck once its colors are on board. So, in hindsight, I could have also pitched the Season Pyromancer. However, I needed a quick way to generate non-human creatures to go off with Winota. So I cast the Pyromancer here and make two bodies to trigger Winota with on the following turn. Uh, since we drew a second Winota, it's not too bad to pitch one of them here. We're feeling pretty reasonable with this decision. Uh, it's We're putting pressure on the opponent and it possibly has a chance to end the game. Our opponent just passes. Cast Winota here, and not with um, Ancient Tomb, so I don't ding myself with too much life. Uh, and I attack with the team, getting two triggers off of Winota, off of the two elemental creatures. One of the triggers gets me another Pyromancer, which 
uh, is not too bad. Uh, however, the second trigger uh, gets us another uh, Winota uh, that can attack. Uh, this is where the, the variance of the deck can sometimes get you. Uh, you're most assuredly at the mercy of hitting your payoffs, and if you don't hit them, that can be problematic. Uh, however, I still believe that the opponent is on snow control, uh, so I think this is still pretty reasonable because it puts the opponent within lethal range, taking them from 16 life to 4 life in the span of a single combat. Uh, however, obviously, uh, as we all know, this is uh, not snow control this is world gorgeous dragon combo uh, so the opponent uh, goes and and entombs for world gorgeous dragon at the end step here paying two mana for it for anthalia and then they proceed to go off the following turn with animate dead world gorgeous dragon loop and uh, so uh, this definitely wins them the first game uh, i conceded for time here uh, since uh, the opponent has, there are creatures in graveyards uh, that can break the loop. Uh, the way the World Grudger Dragon combo works is uh, that it will uh, exile everything and then they can keep generating mana until they decide that they want to break the loop. Uh, another way that they can also break the loop is also to flash in cards like Ice Fang Quaddle or if they have uh, Arkham's Astrolabe in play. Uh, they can continue bringing back those cards and continually drawing cards uh, while they're doing this. Uh, so, again, we can see it for time uh, simply because it doesn't make sense to make our opponent play it out. Uh, there are ways to break the loop. Uh, they can generate infinite mana. They can do really whatever they want with this. So, uh, we move on to game two at this point. Now, as far as sideboarding is concerned here, sideboarding out cards like Blood Sun and bringing in things like Fairy Macabre make the most sense. Uh, this deck plays a lot of cards like Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Uh, so Fairy Macabre's ability utility goes way up in being able to deal with those cards, as well as World Gorger Dragon, while also being uncounterable. Uh, it's one of the biggest things about the card is that you, uh, it's not able to be traditionally countered by a normal spell or effect. So the ability to play against uh, a card like Uro and defeat that card is pretty good. Uh, in the second game, uh, I am on the play uh, here, and uh, I'm trying to go for uh, a turn one opening Chalice of the Void uh, to cut off cards like their cantrips, cut off cards like Entomb, uh, Arkham's Astrolabe, that sort of thing. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they uh, do get it does get countered, uh, so I opt to go onto more of like an aggressive plan here. My opponent casts an Astrolabe to draw a card. So I'm going on more of an aggressive plan with Legion War Boss. Uh, I'm opting to hold up Fairy Macabre in case my opponent has a trick up their sleeve with Entomb or with, you know, Uro, that sort of thing, uh, and try to go on the offensive here. My opponent does some more uh, cantripping with Arkham's Astrolabe. I'm able to stick Thalia into play. And put some put some damage on. Uh, I draw a third land eventually here, and I'm able to uh, put in Goblin Rabble Master as well. Uh, this uh, will actually uh, put them presented to lethal the next turn. Uh, so that will put them from uh, to three life. Uh, so uh, my opponent draws their card, uh, plays the plays a forest, snow covered forest, and then they concede to game three. So moving on to game three, here. All right. So in this third game, I'm back on the draw, uh, which can be somewhat awkward. So I mulligan to a slower hand here. I mulligan this first hand and mulligan to this hand and just hope to draw a mana accelerant. 
Uh, but it also has Fairy Macabre in it, which is uh, big important to uh, beating the Wall Gorger combo. So I do draw a, a, a mana source. It's sort of I'd like a lotus petal because it's uh, a simian spirit guide. And I try to go for an opening turn uh, Trinisphere, uh, but they force a negation it. So at this point, uh, both of us kind of do a whole lot of nothing uh, back and forth uh, until I'm able to draw into a mana source to cast this uh, Thought Knot Seer. So I draw City of Traders and cast Thought Knot Seer. Uh, so. My opponent reveals a whole bunch of black cards uh, that are, all have black in their mana cost, uh, but they don't actually have any black mana available, as we can see here. So knowing that some of these cards are cards like Anime Dead and Entomb, which I have an answer for in the form of Fairy Macabre, and I'm not really actually totally worried about Assassin's Trophy or Decay, uh, because uh, if they Assassin's Trophy, uh, the Thought Not Seer, uh, I get a, a mountain, I can go put into play Goblin Rabble Master pretty easily. They have to have Decay for Goblin Rabble Master. Uh, but, uh, so the biggest threat here is actually uh, Oko, uh, Thief of Crowns, uh, because that card lets them grind out a lot quicker, uh, a lot better than I can grind out their life total uh, by being able to make blockers, by being able to shut off opposing creatures, that sort of thing. Uh, so in the end, I end up taking the Oko here. The opponent does not draw a follow-up black source for the next turn, and I'm able to stick that Rabble Master into play. In addition to drawing a Legion War Boss for the follow-up turn. Now they do eventually get a Polluted Delta into play this turn, uh, but they don't have the ability to go Entomb into Animate Dead in the same turn. Uh, so they have to wait until my end step in order to try and animate dead or to entomb and then animate dead on the following turn. So between uh, the pressure I have in play uh, with Goblin Rabble Master, uh, Thought Knots here, uh, putting into play uh, Legion War Boss here. Uh, it's just going to make uh, two tokens total uh, between Rabble Master and Legion War Boss. Uh, I'm going to put my opponent to a pretty low life total. Uh, they're going to go from 15 down to 3 with all these attacks. At this point, all I need to really do is sit and wait for my opponent to cast Anime Dead. Uh, so... I don't want to give my opponent the chance to have a way to try a different game plan uh, if they decide if I go for the uh, Fairy Macabre now. Uh, so I want them to do it. I want to do it in response to them uh, having Animate Dead in play and then uh, exile it uh, in response to the Animate Dead. There's Animate Dead, there's Fair Macabre, and the opponent concedes the match to this. Match two against Sneak and Show. Again, this match was against Sneak and Show, and that deck can be pretty rough for a Chalice Prison deck to actually deal with, as Chalice on one often does not do enough to actually slow down their game plan. Uh, between Lotus Petal and Ancient Tomb being able to cast Show and Tell. Uh, this often turns Game 1 into a bit of a wash uh, sometimes, but as we will see with Game 1, uh, that actually didn't happen with this one, so that was interesting. Uh, so in Game 1, I'm on the draw with a hand that can cast a turn 1 Trinisphere, and that's pretty reasonable in the blind. 
Uh, my opponent opens on a Volcanic Island, uh, and they daze my first Trinosphere, uh, making me consider that they're on Delver. Uh, it's pretty reasonable to consider that uh, Volcanic Island Days, uh, Brainstorm Days, is a, a Delver deck. Uh, again, this is another good way that blue decks can often mask what they're playing. Sneak and Show has been playing Days uh, for a little bit because card is pretty good at uh, helping out their tempo. So I attempt to cast a second Trinosphere here, uh, and it also gets countered by Force of Will. Uh, so that's fairly awkward. I do, however, have a Cavern of Souls in play to get this Legion War boss into play. Now, my opponent has not done anything just yet. Uh, however, um, I don't actually have a, a way to actually resolve this Winota right now uh, because the Cavern of Souls is naming Goblin. Uh, so I opt to go for uh, Blood Sun instead, uh, to which my opponent does a Brainstorm Fetch uh, so that their Fetch isn't shut off. Having two Marauders in hand is a little awkward here. Uh, but that just means there's two more in my deck. Uh, my opponent does cast Show and Tell here, uh, and uh, I'm putting in Gristle Brand while I get to put in Winota, uh, so that's actually not that bad. They're at 11 life, uh, so actually uh, um, paying life to draw cards through Gristle Brand is a, is a scary proposition for them because uh, they don't know what could get put into play, uh, and it might kill them instantly if they were to draw seven cards. So I go to my turn and go to combat, getting four triggers off of Winota here. Those four triggers get me an Angress Marauders, two Season Pyromancers, and another Winota, which is the one that I end up keeping because uh, the Winota trigger makes them indestructible. The opponent blocks Winota with Gristlebrand and then goes to negative 12 life from 11 life, win me the first game. Now, in post-board matchups, uh, it's much better to have cards like Thought Not Seer and Phyrexian Revoker, uh, since they can steal certain cards as well as be able to shut off things like Gristlebrand and Sneak Attack. Uh, so it's good to have those things in the deck. Uh, Blood Sun is okay, but not fantastic, uh, but it can shut off Fetchlands, uh, which is not bad at all. Moving on to Game 2. I am again on the draw here. This hand is reasonable and has the ability to try and establish a turn one uh, Thalia. Which is not too bad. Uh, however, my turn turn two Goblin Rabble Master does get countered by Force of Will. In hindsight, I maybe should have held this uh, and not tried to cast it right now and maybe try to put it into play off of Show and Tell if they had Show and Tell uh, because it does end up putting me in a position where I don't have a second uh, non-human creature in order to be able to actually trigger Winota. My opponent does show and tell and put in, puts in Gristlebrand. I draw another Winota, uh, which is not fantastic, uh, and a Chrome Mox. Uh, so I, I kind of play it out for a little bit to see if maybe I might draw something uh, and hopefully maybe draw like a non-human creature and they don't have, you know, counter magic to deal with it. Uh, but 
Unfortunately, I draw another uh, mana source, and I just end up having to concede. So in game three, uh, I have to mulligan a little bit uh, here. In which I mulligan to a turn one Goblin Rabble Master. Sorry, the, the Moto replay actually just messed up on me. Uh, these things happen with the, the Magic Online replay tool, unfortunately. All right, so we start on a mulligan. I'm on the play, so I start off with a turn one Goblin Rabble Master. And basically what my, I'm hoping to do here is I'm hoping to put enough aggression on the opponent to kill them before they can get together a reasonable play. Uh, so basically I'm just trying to be as aggressive as possible uh, and hope that maybe I can just put them to a lower life total to make things like Gristlebrand a little harder. Uh, my attempt at a Revoker is indeed countered by Force of Will, uh, so that kind of stinks, but it's fine. Uh, that would have shut off anything, any craziness like the Gristlebrand or anything like that coming down. Uh, however, uh, they're at 11 life. Uh, by turn three here, by swinging for uh, another eight points of damage, uh, I put them to three life uh, and basically force them to have an answer right now. Uh, and since they don't have an answer or a game plan on this turn, uh, they do concede. Uh, this game does a, this is a game was a pretty good uh, job of showing that sometimes uh, your game plan is just good enough to have uh, a, an aggressive slant and make the opponent have a game plan uh, so that you can make them uh, win the game. Uh, otherwise, you put them in a position where they're going to be uh, hard-pressed to beat you. Match three, also against Sneak and Show. Again, as noted, this match was also against Sneak and Show, and was a great showcase of how powerful this deck can be when everything lines up for it. Uh, just fair warning, uh, this game was a loss, uh, this match was a loss, and I had just absolutely no agency in either of these games. Uh, so it was a really kind of a blowout in, uh, on my end, uh, which is fine. Uh, it's, it's certainly something that happens with Sneak and Show. Uh, so in game one, uh, they open on a snow-covered island uh, and ponder, or preordain, actually. Uh, and I try to open on a Trinosphere, which gets dazed. Uh, now, since my opponent opened on that snow-covered island, and I know that Delver doesn't run any basic lands typically, uh, I kind of expected that my opponent was, again, on Sneak and Show. I cast Chalice on one, uh, but it hardly matters uh, here, uh, because my opponent will cast, sneak, uh, cast Show and Tell, uh, and put in Omniscience, uh, uh, and then cast a Gristlebrand. Uh, so uh, I concede to save time in this game simply because uh, there's no way I'm going to beat this Gristlebrand uh, and this Omniscience. Game two, uh, we sideboard to round typically the same. Uh, however, it doesn't really totally matter. Uh, this game two, I have to mulligan to four. Uh, and hope to find uh, something uh, here. So uh, my hope is that I, I would like to resolve both Chalice on 1 and Chalice on 0 uh, to prevent any sort of uh, you know cantrips, but also to prevent cards like Lotus Petal, that sort of thing. Uh, it's not going to stop a turn 2, uh, like Ancient Tomb you know, or City of Traders play. Uh, into show and tell uh, but it can do something uh, however uh, I don't draw any mana sources whatsoever my opponent does not cast show and tell and they cast sneak attack uh, so therefore uh, I concede to that
match four versus depth combo. This matchup ended up being against depth combo and was actually a pretty fairly interesting match. Uh, one nice thing about Winota is that the card Blood Sun tends to shut off many of the utility lands that the depths deck plays. This makes uh, matchups a little bit easier for this deck. I start off on the draw here, uh, and my opponent starts off with Sylvan Scrying uh, to get Urborg Train with Yawgmoth. Uh, hoping that my opponent doesn't have something like crop rotation or discard spells, uh, I start off with Chalice on one. So now my opponent only has this Thespian Stage and Urborg, which gives me leave to resolve Bloods on here. Now, as you will notice here, the Blood Sun actually does not shut off the Urborg Tomb of Yawgmoth ability. Uh, this is because of the layer system uh, in which the ability, the land types are assigned at a different layer than the abilities being taken away by Blood Sun. Uh, so that can be a little bit awkward. Uh, my opponent Silver Scrying for Dark Depths and passes turn. Uh, so I draw a second Blood Sun here. Uh, and so I opt to follow up with the second one, uh, just in case my opponent randomly has Abrupt Decay in their hand. Uh, this will prevent a situation where my opponent would play the Dark Depths and then Abrupt Decay the Blood Stun, which would then immediately trigger the Depths. My opponent hard casts a Elvish Spirit Guide, and I am able to resolve a Goblin Rabble Master into play. I resolve Winota. Getting her into play. And the following triggers will put into play double Angrass Marauders, uh, which will take the opponent from 20 life to negative 12. Now, since depths can easily combo, uh, it's the very nature of the sideboard here uh, is good against it with cards bringing any cards like Megas of the Moon, which immediately come in out of the sideboard for this deck. In game two here, uh, my opponent uh, leads on Duress over a another discard spell like Inquisition or Thoughtseize or anything like that. So, of course, the only thing that they can take uh, from my hand is uh, Chrome Mox, which is the only legal target there. This allows me to resolve a turn one Magus of the Moon. And, of course, they play a Dark Depths. We both kind of spin our wheels here while I can continue to attack with the Magus. Uh, as we both kind of just draw kind of nothing. They Inquisition me uh, and take another creature, uh, but I'm, I'm drawing very little mana to cast my spells. And they Thought Seize me, take away that Seasoned Pyromancer which is not a bad card. Trinosphere is not doing anything here. Uh, so I managed to get this Chrome Mox here and managed to resolve the uh, Seasoned Pyromancer, uh, which is the more important card here because it just creates bodies and pushes through damage. So at 10 life, my opponent decides to concede the match. And we move on to the next round. Again, this is a pretty interesting match. I think uh, it had some interesting play to it, uh, especially uh, with my opponent not having the correct discard spells. Uh, I don't think it was... Uh, it, I think they were maybe expecting Blood Moon uh, over Magus of the Moon, uh, which if I'd have had Blood Moon instead, then I would have been in real trouble uh, to that Dark Depths. 
but uh, thankfully they didn't have that. I had uh, I had Megas of the Moon instead. So. Match five versus Dredge. So my opponent here is a pretty well-known Dredge pilot. Uh, I know them from on the Dredge Discord uh, that I also help uh, administer. So I knew exactly what I was getting into with this match. Being on the draw in the first game was not going to help me at all. Uh, Dredge is a pretty highly explosive deck and could come out of nowhere to win. Uh, so I was definitely uh, concerned uh, about this matchup. Uh, so game one, I mulligan to a hand that has Chalice and also Winota and Warboss. Seemed like a pretty reasonable hand uh, to be able to beat uh, some of their bustedness. However, with them uh, resolving a Faithless Looting into uh, a Dredge 5, it's pretty good. Uh, so I resolve Chalice on one, hoping to catch them on being able to resolve another Looting spell and hoping that they just kind of brick on their Dredge. Um, however, uh, the powerful dredge opponent pilot that uh, my opponent is uh, casts Breakthrough for X equals 1, uh, which has a converted mana cost of 2, which bypasses the Chalice. This mills them for over half of their deck uh, and lets them cast Hogak, Arisen Necropolis, uh, with a whole bunch of other creatures in the play, uh, including um, some uh, Narc Amoebas. The double bridge. There's Hogak. Suffice to say, uh, no matter what I do here, I am dead the following turn, uh, simply because uh, they will be able to put enough pressure on with Icarid and all these other fun creatures uh, in order to get me. Uh, they don't even have to block, if I were to play Legion Warboss, they don't even have to block the uh, token because it doesn't actually matter. They can just let their bridges survive and... I, I'm basically a functionally dead. So, um, sideboarding for this uh, matchup, this side, this matchup actually made me really consider, uh, slightly reconsider the graveyard hate package that's in this deck. Uh, and it just kind of made me wonder if Fairy Macabre uh, shouldn't just be the Leyline of the Void. Uh, Leyline of the Void is a typical card for Stompy decks to have a permanent form of graveyard hate, and so it generally is pretty good uh, in that regards. Uh, so I had good experience with Fairy Macabre, but against a deck like Dredge, uh, if that was generally more popular, I would want Leyline of the Void instead. Uh, so it forces them to have to answer with it. Uh, with um, Fairy Macabre, it's not as easy to use that against it. In fact, actually, it's pretty impossible. Uh, so I'm on the play with another Chalice on one in game two. Uh, and I'm basically just kind of hoping to make it hard for them to resolve their, their looting effects. Uh, however, my opponent, again, is a very smart and powerful dredge wizard, uh, and so they just move to discard and discard a Golgari Thug instead, which is pretty good, I have to admit. Uh, this is actually a really cool galaxy brain play uh, from uh, my opponent uh, to get around chalice effects. Uh, they dredge the Golgari uh, thug and get a narc amoeba and then they are able to play lion's eye diamond into cephalid coliseum cracking lion's eye diamond for for blue and using lion uh, cephalid coliseum to target themselves so while they mill a reasonable amount of cards here they don't actually hit any gas this turn uh, so i just kind of have to hope that maybe the the rabble master play uh, is helpful or not? Not sure. Uh, so I'm able to attack. If I were to draw a Winota at any point here, it could be pretty good. Uh, however, uh, my opponent is able to get both Hogak into play, uh, but then they're also able to Dread Return into a Golgari Grave Troll. And basically ends up with a 13-13 in play. Which would require me to have exactly Winota off the top of my deck in order to beat. 
so if I don't draw, a, if I didn't draw a Winota, uh, I would not be able to beat this board state. Uh, it's it's very very strong. Unfortunately, we draw a planes, so therefore we we just cannot muscle through this board state at all. This league was generally very interesting and fun to play, and also this deck had some pretty fun and interesting moments to it. One thing I definitely want to reconsider for the future for this list is the Graveyard Hate in the sideboard. Uh, I would just hope to have Leyline of the Void going forward, as opposed to Fairy Macabre. Uh, but that's a pretty minor change in the grand scheme of things. Uh, in addition, I'd also probably consider shaving a uh, Seasoned Pyromancer to three copies to find room for another castable non-human creature that provides some sort of value. Uh, possibly that creature ended up being a, a main deck Phyrexian Revoker, uh, just to deal with certain cards uh, that come up. Uh, so, other than that, uh, this is a deck that you might like if you like kind of playing a, a kind of an aggressive uh, prison-based strategy. Uh, you might like it if uh, you want something that's pretty straightforward to sideboard with and is generally a lot of fun to play. So thank you guys for joining me in this video. Uh, just remember you can catch my articles every Wednesday on MTG Goldfish at This Week in Legacy. And you can also reach me on Twitter at BullRathXP. Thank you guys and have a great day. And, and until next time.